Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Stephanie LaRue. I am the Associate Director at CSREA, the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America. CSREA is an interdisciplinary hub that aims to build community with the public and among scholars and students race, working on race and ethnicity in and around the United States. Today's event, entitled Black and Indigenous Resistance in the Americas, From Multiculturalism to Racist Backlash, uh, was a two-part event featuring a panel of, of uh, experts that have contributed to the newly published edited volume by the same name. The effort is the product of a multi-year transnational research project by the Anti-Racist Research and Action Network of the Americas. The volume charts the rise of racial uh, recalcitrance and the anti-racist resistance by Black and Indigenous people in seven countries of the Americas. Brazil, Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, Guatemala, Mexico, and the United States. This presentation is a CSREA faculty grant event organized by Juliet Hooker, professor of political science at Brown University. Please note that the book uh, that is in focus of today's discussion is available for purchase conveniently through the link in the chat feature. CSR, CSRA also invites you to attend our other events. Uh, you can find more information about these events and more at www.brown.edu slash race. At this time, I'd like to invite Dr. Juliet Hooker to introduce our guests. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. And thanks again to CSRA and the wonderful staff at the center who has done such a great job um, doing, putting this webinar together as well as media services for their help um, in conducting it. Um, I want to welcome you to the second of two panels that we've been conducting to um, celebrate the publication of this volume, um, Black, um, From Multiculturalism to Racist Backlash, Black and Indigenous Resistance in the Americas, um, which has been many years in the making. As with the first uh, uh, panel, we have only a, um, a, some of the participants and contributors um, to the volume present in this panel. So I want to again name um, all the contributors to the volume um, and, uh, um, who are not all with us today. Jaime Antimilca Yupan, Eliana Antonio Rosero, Pamela Calla, Rosalinda Cárdenas, Rigoberto Ashkanon Choi, Jacqueline Curaqueo Mariano, Eileen Ford, Jaime Garcia Leiva, Charles R. Hale, Charomina Rojas, Mariana Mora, Leif Mullings, Hector Nahuel Pan Moreno, Eduardo Restrepo, Luciani Rocha, Irma Nicia Velasquez Nimatuj, and Howard Weinert. Uh, there's been a change in the lineup from what we originally advertised. Leif Mullings um, is um, very um, sad that she could not be with us today. So, Tiana Pachelle, who is going to offer comments um, on the first panel, has joined us on this panel. Um, so, because Leif hasn't can't be here and her chapter is a chapter on the movement for black lives in the United States. I want to say a little bit about her analysis of the movement um, in, in, in her chapter in the book and what it tells us about where we are now and where we might be going. In her chapter, Leith argues that the current moment is, um, and the current moment of, of racist backlash that culminated in the, in the Trump administration is both the expression of the long history of um, anti-Black racism and white supremacy in the United States, but also represents a qualitative departure from previous decades. She argues that together the Trump administration, congressional Republicans, donors, and right-wing media monopolists, um, a section of U.S. capitalists and ordinary citizens are consciously and systematically engaged in a determined effort to impose a new um, but highly unstable racial project based on a resurgent revenge as white supremacy unfettered by the advances of the last few decades. And she says that this will require new strategies um, to resist. And I think much of her analysis has been borne out in the, the um, resurgence of anti-racist protests in recent, um, in recent um, months. And I just want to say a little bit is that her 
takeaway of her fascinating analysis and ethnography of the movement for Black Lives, which I really encourage you to, to read, is that the movement for Black Lives, which was born of protests against police executions, and precisely because of their experience of living class through race, has in a few short years created a critique of the established order that offers insights into evolving modes of capitalism, not always evident to those who analyze society from a more privileged position. Most significantly, it is building coalitions around a program for the structural transformation of society. It's time to retire the term identity politics. These analysis, as well as that of um, our collective analysis in the volume is that a critique of racial capitalism is central to the, um, the, the analysis of many of the movements that we, have in, that we followed throughout this project and that it's also central to the way, the way forward in confronting this current moment of racial reckoning. So um, before I move on to introducing our panelists, um, I want to say that we, the members of RIAR, the Research and Action Network of the Americas, are dedicating this um, book launch to a member of the network, Andres Kaya, who recently passed away. And I want to um, um, invite um, Pamela Kaya to offer some reflections for, from his family. In, um, in a few minutes. But before I do that, I just want to introduce the members of the panel. We are um, um, joined by Pamela Kaya from N NYU and one of the founding members of the Observatorio um, um, del Racismo in Bolivia, Charles Hale from UC Santa Barbara, who together with Lee Mullings wrote the chapter on relational analysis that you'll be discussing. And we're delighted to welcome Tiana Pichel from UC Berkeley and Agustin Lalmontes from UMass Amherst who will offer comments on the book. And we're, we're delighted to be in conversation with uh, Tiana and Agustin who are our colleagues whom, whom we are, have been in dialogue with for many years. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to ask Pamela to say, um, to offer a few words about Andres before moving to Tiana, who will offer her comments on the first panel. Hola. ¿Me escuchan bien? Yes. Um, sí, a few words of And about Andres, who was my nephew and who was also the co-founder of, of, of the Observatorio del Racismo en Bolivia. Uh, he was a sociologist activist whose work focused on anti-racism, extractivism, and climate change. He was a researcher at the Centro de Estudios para el Desarrollo Laboral y Agrario. He was a dear father to Silvio and Lara, and he and his partner Camtuta Murucci, as well as their colleagues and sociology cohort in the Observatorio Boliviano, became central to the foundation and co-foundation of RAYAR with the rest of us. Uh, I want to read here um, excerpts from his latest writings. Ricardo Calla and Jenny Cardenas, his uh, parents, sent me this, uh, these excerpts this morning, and I'm going to do that in Spanish. El 11 de julio de 2020, Andrés escribió en uno de sus últimos artículos, ¿Qué existe? ¿Qué puede existir? ¿Y cuáles son los parámetros de realidad que determinan esa posibilidad de existencia? Y entonces, ¿qué puede cambiar y cómo? ¿Hay condiciones en todo nivel? ¿O todo es consecuencia de una especie de fuerza creativa ilimitada? ¿Por qué sufrimos? ¿Y existe una dialéctica entre estas dos posibilidades, creación y sufrimiento? Esas fueron preguntas de cierre de uno de sus ensayos. Desde una lectura crítica, pero a la vez abierta a los aportes de los marxismos más serios y complejos, Andrés consideraba que bajo estas cuestiones podríamos pensar que bajo determinadas perspectivas el mundo material estaría subordinado al mundo de la existencia. Andrés afirmaba muy poco antes de dejarnos que el dibujo de la existencia es probablemente interminable y el proceso de descubrimiento quizás infinito. 
Desde esa perspectiva, Andrés consideraba que la acción colectiva e individual contra el racismo como una de las condiciones de existencia en el mundo actual debía ser diaria, constante, persistente, consciente y sin tregua. Seguramente hoy, Andrés, que está entre nosotros, acompaña la presentación del libro que hoy aquí ofrecemos recordándonos con palabras que escribió en mayo de este año en otro de sus artículos. Todo lo que necesita corregirse necesita un proceso de cambio o de transformación para dar lugar a aquello que buscamos. Para Andrés, estos procesos de transformación deberían ser también como punto de partida la transformación de nuestros espíritus, de nuestro mundo interior más profundo, de nuestro ser ligado a la verdad con mayúsculas de la no discriminación y el antirracismo. Andrés, your capacity to analyze our social reality, your endless capacity to love, your sweetness and commitment to the people that you were with will stay with us forever. Gracias por permitirme estas palabras para Andrés. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Pamela, for that beautiful remembrance. And thank you to the parents of Andres. Um, what a loss, but what a gain um, this world has had um, with him in it. So um, I'm going to just read my remarks so that I don't um, go too much over. I'd first like to congratulate Juliet and all of the contributors to this uh, phenomenal volume. This book gives us so much to think through about the possibilities, but also more profoundly the limitations of rights. At the same time that I think it offers the most vivid picture of the complex, always moving and extraordinarily brave work that black and indigenous movements are engaged in throughout the region. It also contributes by offering a model of doing research that is both uh, deeply rigorous and complex on the one hand, but also grounded in real political commitments and urgency on the other. It centers not only the struggles of Black and Indigenous communities, but it also centers their knowledge production. So this volume and the presentations um, so far raise a number of questions and um, I think that that's what good work does, right? Um, but I'm going to try to focus my comments on uh, what I think they say about the political economy of anti-Blackness and anti-indigeneity and what this work uh, may tell us about the fight for rights and the limits of liberal democracy uh, more generally. Uh, so many of the chapters of this volume show painfully the interworkings of racial capitalism by showing us the many economic incentives and interests that often undergird anti-Blackness and anti-indigeneity, and also the power that gets wielded with that. It comes out, I think, really powerfully um, in the chapter uh, by Irma and Rigoberto on Guatemala. This chapter reminds us of how the most violent form of racism manifests in genocide, and in so doing shows us rather than see genocide as irrational or as an aberration, or even purely about power, uh, to see it as, uh, as, as continual, as a logic that's built into institutions, and also as something that's extremely profitable. It is no surprise then that the state um, and international institutions answer to supposedly repairing genocide, in the case of Guatemala, but we could think about Brazil as well, is superficial and remains ephemeral. So this book raises questions not only about uh, the kind of de dehumanizing aspects of anti-Blackness and anti-indigeneity, but also the material interests that are foundational to this. They show us how the real enjoyment of rights by Indigenous and Black people in Latin America and the United States implies not only a legal and ideological shift, but it also means disrupting the systems of dispossession and accumulation that extend way beyond this era of neoliberalism. It would not only mean redistribution, but a radical shifting of the development models um, in these countries, even the ones that are uh, ostensibly about redistribution that the left um, has engaged in in the last couple of decades before this move to the right. 
because even in the context of these Latin American, um, the shift of the pink tide, um, what we see is an over-reliance on accumulation and over-reliance on extractivism rather than their undermining. And I think the chapter on Bolivia is very clear on this point. This is perhaps why uh, Leith and Charlie argue in their chapter that, quote, the successor strategy of anti-racism should be based on efforts to, quote, bolster the political economic power of racialized groups with primary recourse neither to state-centered and state-sanctioned humanist values of liberal democracy, nor to state-endorsed minority rights. Instead, they argue, for a contestation of white supremacy that begins with a fundamental critique of racial capitalism. And this does seem to be the place where movements throughout the volume have landed after this often failed experiment in multiculturalism. And yet, um, in addition to taking seriously this political economy of anti-Blackness and anti-indigeneity, um, there are some really interesting things that the volume uh, brings out around thinking about the cultural formation that has happened in this period, right? Particularly the politicization of, 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 of dominant um, groups, racial identities, right? In the case of the United States and Brazil, um, we see that very powerfully. The state and capital have surely stood uh, with their foot on the neck, so to speak, of marginalized groups. Um, but in this context of backlash, there's also a real role that popular counter mobilization does play. And we see this um, in these movements to undermine the peace uh, agreement and the peace process in Colombia. Um, we see this in the chapter um, of Leith's analysis of the movement for black lives in the United States. And the type of redistribution that has happened across Latin America, as Juliet Hooker reminds us, is, is mild um, at best, and yet uh, the kind of symbolic politics around loss um, experienced by um, racially dominant groups um, is, is endless, right? And, and, and um, violent often, the reaction. So all of these things um, have happened though within the context of these um, economic systems that are premised on extractivism and unchecked accumulation um, by the wealthy. Um, and some modest redistribution in the context of, of economic booms. And so to kind of understand some of uh, what's happening in this volume, I think it's really interesting to kind of think about where not just the state lies, but where um, ordinary citizens are in all of this who don't uh, benefit from these very limited rights, right? There was no social contract, no cultural shift, no agreement um, for, um, from those at the top or even at the middle to sacrifice, to redistribute. Um, and so um, it's no surprise that the sort of reaction is vehement, especially when the um, commodities bust happens and, and states can no longer sustain these modest, uh, these modest policies. And so we see um, some really real, uh, like profound uh, popular backlash. And so I have questions about how we are to think about the racial politics of that backlash, but my hope is that uh, others will talk about that. So where does this all leave us? Um, if multicultural rights are hollow, not only because of this backlash, not only because of these economic bus cycles, not only because of this deadly and dramatic swing to the right, but because they were never intended to be anything else but hollow, where does that leave us? My favorite moments in the book are ones where the authors, um, scholar activists, activists make sense of this contemporary um, moment in relationship to the past when the critique of multicultural rights and of neoliberalism also leads them to uh, deeper critiques of the foundation of rights themselves or to statecraft more generally. Liberal democracy and its inseparable relationship to racial capitalism should make us weary of rights as the holy grail of organizing. But I also wonder what uh, Colombia's Pacific Coast or the south of the country might look like without them. What would the pace of completely unfettered racial capitalism mean for Black and Indigenous communities there? There seems like there would be further dispossession, further violence, both state and extra legal, and fewer in-between spaces to etch out livelihoods that run against dominant economic models. I also uh, think about the work of uh, the Anti-Police Terror Project here in the Bay Area, which has been doing um, amazing work over the last years calling for defunding the police. 
but at the very same time, even as they build up utopian realities of a world without police, even as they engage in politics of radical refusal to accept the world as we know it, they have also been successfully organizing around uh, legislation to have access to police disciplinary records and getting bills introduced um, that would have community trained people be the first responders in emergencies rather than the police. It is a both and approach right to rights and something that we see in movements throughout this book from PCN or uh, Proceso de Comunidades Negras in Colombia to the black women's organizations that organize the historic Marcha das Mulheres. It is a, a, a strategies that are centered on both rights and on refusal simultaneously. And this is perhaps why I'm apprehensive about giving up on rights entirely, even if they are rights that were conceded with bankruptcy in mind. I'm also still interested in rights because of what they produce, if not rights themselves. The authors of this volume show brilliantly and painfully that one of the most devastating effects of Black and Indigenous mobilization has been the counter movements against them, both state-led and, 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 and popular. Along those lines, um, and as we assess the period of ethno-racial reforms and what it actually was, we should be asking questions about what the effects have been, not just in terms of the rights they purported to offer or extend, but their unintended consequences, what forms of productive power they produce and what kinds of reactionary politics they unleash, um, then we can better understand this moment. I think for me, some of the things that come up in this uh, volume and also in my own work is to think about how this moment has shifted the relationships between um, black and indigenous movements in the state. Um, and there are um, many things that one could think about. So if policies for black, uh, populations in particular produce anything, it was uh, limited access to state bureaucracies, um, and in some cases, uh, access to political parties. And uh, we see this uh, with Luciani's um, uh, adept analysis of the different stages of Black women's organizing in Brazil and looking at institutionalization and um, other, other phases, right? And so, um, whereas we see uh, moments, at least in the context of Black movements in Brazil, um, in the 1960s, 70s, um, where um, Black activists might have been laughed out of uh, public meetings and, um, and in formal engagement with the state, um, they have been legitimized, not in the sense that the state concedes actual power, but in the sense that Black activists are people who must be dealt with. They must be bought off, they must be persecuted, they must be jailed, they must be killed, they must be co-opted. And I would argue that this is, uh, this so-called multicultural turn actually served to reorient the state's uh, uh, position on how you deal with these Black activists, how you deal with these Indigenous activists. And um, even if uh, the movements remain far from actual power. There's also evidence in this book um, and in other work um, that rights have produced what uh, activist Carlos Rosero calls new modalities of violence. Um, at least in the Colombian context, we see that when communities start to uh, demand rights and access their rights, when they start to survey their territories and identify the natural resources on them, submit paperwork to governments to apply for collective land titles, somewhat ironically, these territories become knowable in new ways. And this paired with the new rights regime means that those determined to dispossess these communities um, of, of their territories must do it in, in new ways, um, um, using new forms of violence, um, using legal apparatuses as well as extra legal ones. And so um, this is not a story of communities winning always, obviously, but I think that there are ways in which um, no matter how hollow the rights are um, or how often they are trampled over, at least um, there are these new politics that we must understand about how that um, process un um, unfolds in these moments, what kind of violence um, gets produced in these moments. We can also see new politicized identities and, and Juliet Hooker in her introduction does this well of, of looking at how um, perhaps um, in an unprecedented way we see uh, white and mestizo um, identity um, 
being solidified and more politicized ways and more visible ways, especially in the context of uh, Bolsonarismo in Brazil. Um, but we also see it um, in, in the United States. It's not in unprecedented ways, but new ways that whiteness uh, shows up in a supposedly post-racial world, right? And so to kind of think about uh, the moment of limited reforms as producing uh, those uh, racial dominant kind of uh, identity politics, um, to, use, to use that word, I guess. Um, and so I say this all to say that um, when I think about this book, I think about uh, both the, the, the failed aspect of multicultural rights, um, but also the productive aspect and productive um, more in a Foucauldian sense of like what they produce. Um, and I, I think that, that, that the volume does that very well. And so some of the questions I have for panelists of the last panel, but also this panel is, um, is there anything redeem redeemable in the wake of rights? Is there anything worth fighting for within these kind of formal legal structures? What if anything um, might engaging in formal politics do at this juncture? And I'm reminded of the impulse um, here in the United States um, for movements to step back from radical stances, um, given the political urgency of the moment, right? You do whatever you can to get Trump out of office and um, even more so, um, that um, RBG um, has recently passed away. And so I wonder what, um, what movements are to do in this context of, of, uh, of where um, the like sort of political expediency of the moment may get in the way of these much longer and much uh, more ideologically grounded stances about um, how to engage in formal politics. And finally, my question for the volume and for the authors here on this panel is to, is about uh, what about the transnational? So um, we know that many of the movements that contributed to the volume as well as Agustin Laumontes' work with Arak and also his book Contra Punteos Diasporicos all um, point to the fact that um, especially the kind of politics of refusal that we see in the Mapuche chapter also, um, I don't know if required, but often go in tandem with um, finding um, finding uh, community outside of the nation and, and, and forging movements in transnational ways. And so I wondered if uh, the um, authors on this panel could speak more to the transnational and where it might fit in, especially if we were to think about um, the, limit, the limits of uh, liberal democracy. Is there, wh what exactly is the space for transnational organizing um, in this moment? And um, yeah, what role should it play um, in broader strategies um, uh, for liberation? And I'll just end by saying um, just how important and meaningful this volume is, uh, I think generally, but also to me, um, it, is, it is one of those things that is absolutely bigger than the sum of its parts. Everyone is doing such beautiful, amazing work individually, but somehow in this volume, it um, sort of amplifies that work and, um, and, it's, and it's a really beautiful, beautiful contribution. So thank you so much um, for inviting me to comment on it today. Congratulations, felicitaciones, parabéns. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tiana, for such wonderful comments. Um, I first also want to thank um, the center um, for uh, organizing this event, Juliet, for, uh, for hosting it. Um, uh, I want to thank um, the network that we formed uh, that um, despite it all, the collaborative project that we launched in 2010 is alive um, and it's, uh, it's wonderful to be part of all of you. Um, uh, to, um, I, think, uh, I think one of Tiana's comments uh, are very, are very um, important to what I'm going to say about Bolivia now. And um, sort of, uh, Tiana, you said, you know, it is the systems of dispossession that we have to look at. And yes, rights, yes, legal rights, yes, uh, to interaction with the state, but uh, let's look at that. How, how are we dealing with the systems of dispossession? Um, and you also said shifting of development models, it seems to be important. Um, 
and uh, in the case of Bolivia, you mentioned there was an over reliance on accumulation by dispossession and reliance on extractivism. So yeah, my chapter deals with that specifically. Um, it was a very, um, it was to dialogue with the larger project uh, in terms of how hollow rights are. Bolivia seemed like an exception because we had gone through major, major changes. We sort of pushed, the movement pushed uh, uh, to have an, a first indigenous president. Social movements were on the rise and uh, yeah, so it seemed like, like an exception, but the reality uh, showed to be uh, uh, different. Rights also rang hollow, hollow in Bolivia, even though the legislation uh, uh, said um, uh, progressive and very uh, even anti-systemic uh, things uh, uh, and uh, were looking at systemic changes. But the, the, the policy itself ended up being paralyzed. Uh, so the wholeness had another history uh, in Bolivia, but hollow it was, rights were hollowed nevertheless. So in the chapter I go from a sort of like describing and, and really getting into the observatory of racism, getting into this vibrant beginning of making changes, anti -racist, getting involved in anti-racist, in the anti-racist movement uh, and making, pushing legislation, etc. to little by little get into a murky paralysis. So the anti-racist movement found a, stum a stumble block. And the central part of this story uh, uh, was the merging of the movement with state priorities. There was a merging, there was a process of co-optation and day-to-day -day paralysis of uh, policy making within the state structure. Um, um, the second part of the chapter talks about, uh, uh, about indigenous women and their activism and indigenous women who had been part of the project for social, uh, for social change in Bolivia who were contributors to a process of change, structural change. But there was a moment, especially since 2010, where they had to navigate points of rupture and expulsion, marginalization and abandonment and criminalization and fragmentation. The central part of this story, however, is also the notion of cuerpos territorio and what the Chilean Mapuche, uh, the Mapuche team shows uh, this, this very monumental effort on the part of indigenous women to, uh, to do autonomia sin permiso, where the consulta previa, collective property uh, rights of land, uh, which were constitutional, constitutionalized in Bolivia, became sites of contestation of the intensification of extractivism in the Evo Morales uh, administration. This intensification of the extractive agenda needed a, a, a very strong centralized, even seniorial state. And what I called in the chapter following uh, Federico Finkelstein, who talks about a macho populist form of governance. So the, the chapter is sort of like this attempt to really look seriously at the weight of patriarchy in the Bolivian process in that was in what was called el proceso de cambio. So I'm going to read, I, I get nervous, so I'm going to read parts of the, of, the, of the chapter. So there's a general sense of where it went. Um, and I'm going to concentrate on the, um, on the, on the conclusion but with also pointing out uh, what indigenous women were saying about uh, these processes of cooptation, this process of really not getting into systemic structural changes. And um, uh, for example, uh, I, put it in, I put it 
in one of the of, of the places uh, in the chapter. Rojas's distinction between different forms of democracy go right to the heart of the de facto one party systems consolidation and appropriation of social movements and of democracy as electoral pol politics. Arminda Cruz explained this instrumental use of organic social and communal organizations. Conamac, she said, supported the government until, quote unquote, they gave us the house, they took away the house. It hurts them that we create a political instance from where to challenge and contest. So they criminalize us. We are on the blacklist. They do not work at an organic level. That is the government, Conamac does. We start from the smallest to the highest level that is in the haki, which is the political path. We're worried that our indigenous authorities would have to dress up as politicians. We do not have to function as political parties. You cannot sell out to a political party. You need to go along with customary law in order to slow down, this is mine, in order to slow down instrumental reasoning. Another reflection. The more local and communal indigenous movement in Bolivia is now being led by indigenous women. Their communities are sustained by women in families maintaining a communal idea and practice by but troubling dominant notions of gender as well as ethnicity. Women affirm that it is in this idea practice that the territory cannot be divided. It cannot be stingy because they are collective lands. This communal space practice idea is female and women are in leadership positions. According to the Grajeda, as a result, masculine voices cannot be authorized too much. They are slowed down and the patriarchal intensity that they adopt in negotiations with the state, the party and extractive multinational representatives is ameliorated. When the communal idea practice is not a place-based modality of indigenous land connected practices, it is harder to slow down the government's attempt to divide communities and families. And in the conclusion, to sort of uh, go a little bit deeper in this in these notions that allow indigenous women to forge autonomia sin permiso, um, I say, propelled forward by the political lynching that took place in Sucre on May 25th, 2008, the Bolivian Observatory Against Racism launched a vigorous campaign of anti-racist research and action. Many other, other organizations joined the struggle as well, and a legislative and policy making process ensued. One of the outcomes of this process was the creation of the Comité de Lucha contra el Racismo y toda forma de discriminación, and the state seemed to support the effort, giving it vice ministerial support. Gradually, however, it became clear that the vice ministry of decolonization intended to appropriate and appropriate anti-racist struggles and neutralize the transform transformative potential of this institutional site. Meanwhile, the agenda of the state became the backdrop for this appropriation on, of anti-racist activism. When the Tipnis crisis erupted, all the organizations in the community were thus caught in a bind. How to oppose racism as extractivism when the perpetrator is an indigenous state committed to anti-racism? Eventually, the Comité began to fall apart under the strains of these contradictions and the observatory of which I am part of and the other member organizations of the Comité buckled in various ways under the same strains. The observatory, however, continues engaging in independent research action processes and making alliances with autonomous organizations nationally and internationally. It is through these independent actions and connections that the observatory was able to map the extractive agenda and the racial project of the state and construct an incipient critique of how rights, either to live in an anti-racist society or to territorially, territorially based self-government are being hollowed out in Bolivia today. There is no space for anti-racist opposition to the state to the state's tip these policies, that is to its extractive development mod model being imposed by the seniorial state owner of underground resources and territory. 
In this process, the practice of Vivienne as an alternative to extractive development was limited and relegated to a rhetoric of plural national identity politics. This rhetoric also uh, prioritized a gendered populism that restricted decolonization and anti-racism and all forms of discrimination to a legislative process monitored from above and centered on a centralized notion of indigenous identity associated mostly with Highland and Vienne communities loyal to the president and to the party in government. And I go on, but I, to finish up, I wanna, um, uh, I wanna do what uh, Juliet asked us to do, to think what we had written before um, uh, what's going on right now, uh, what we take out from those, from, from those reflections that we had written in the book. And um, so what I, what I wanna say, say is that after the ouster resignation of Evo Morales, um, uh, one of the questions for me, given what I wrote in that chapter and what the observatory people, uh, members and I, Sort of reflect, reflecting, reflected upon. My main question uh, is uh, how was the hegemony of the cultural revolution, Proceso de Cambio, led by Morales, our first indigenous president, broken? Or what was broken in that process? What were the points of rupture that accumulated over a 13 year old period and led to the crisis of an hegemony and its breakdown? Could we talk about continuities instead? Where and why the Proceso de Cambio turned into something else even before the October election of, in, 19, in 2019? Actually starting in 2010 when Morales allied with agro-industry based on the Eastern uh, lowlands, when the now hated Union Juvenil Crucenista was incorporated into the mass youth structure to the surprise of mass youth organizations that weeks before were in frontal confrontation. Um, I also received one of the main people that I'm in touch with of Contio Capa, one indigenous organization. Her name is Ruth Alipas. And talking about the continuity, continuity of the intensification of extractive policies, for example, and of the criminalization of movements uh, in this new administration, which is pretty rightist. Um, and, and what she says is that what has started with this new administration, of course, is the continuation of this uh, politica extractivista, but also a politics of abandonment. The, she says, te pido disculpas por no haber respondido antes, pero ante la situación de pandemia y con muchas actividades extractivas que continuaron en los territorios que provocaron contagios, hemos estado rebasados de situaciones que intentaren atender por nosotros mismos ante el abandono del gobierno transitorio. Eh, eso es parte de lo que dice más, pero quería puntualizarlo for, for, for all of you. Um, and finally, I would say uh, in relation to autonomía sin permiso and the notion of cuerpo territorio that comes out of the, of the of indigenous women's struggles in Bolivia, as well as other countries in Latin America, um, uh, is that um, it is this um, self in the relation with others, self as related to others, uh, what allowed them to, um, allows them to keep on thinking systemic, uh, uh, alternatives that even though right now seem almost uh, impossible given the backlash, given uh, the racial retrenchment, um, uh, it is those notions and those practices at those local levels that will uh, be uh, part of our future struggle as indigenous women. Thank you. Good evening, good afternoon, or good morning, good afternoon to those 
we're in different time zones. I'm, I'd like to start, as others have, um, by invoking <clears throat> the presence of Andres Kaya, who, as Pamela just uh, mentioned, was present at the very, very beginning of a 10 year process that has resulted uh, in in many in many activities, including the production of this book, uh, Andres, you're you're with us here in spirit. Uh, thanks also to Brown University, uh, to the the those at the center that have helped to make this possible. Um, and I want to I want to note uh, that the, I'm going to be talking, as Juliet mentioned, um, about a comparative chapter that was. Uh, written collaboratively by myself and Leith Mullings, who unfortunately can't join us today, um, and and is very much based on the collaboration uh, and and collective work of of all uh, the research teams, and particularly as others have mentioned, uh, a, a research process that was grounded in the principles of activist scholarship of investigación. Politicamente Comprometida, uh, which involved, a, uh, in each case, a very uh, carefully crafted collaboration, attempted collaboration between uh, those based more in the academy and those based more in, in direct activist work. And I think, uh, as Lee's uh, statement that Juliet uh, summarized very briefly, uh, stated eloquently, this uh, Produced a whole series of, of important uh, important products as we went through uh, this this process, and most importantly, a sense that the process of resistance of these of these protagonists in the seven sites of struggle really provided the key insights uh, for understanding the uh, the structures and the changing structures of, of racism that the uh, that the organizations and, and all of us are confronting. <clears throat> so I remember very clearly when uh, in this process of dialogue, when the, the spark of what of the central theme of the, of the project emerged, we were meeting in Bogota, Colombia, in the Afro-Colombian organization um, PCN, which various uh, Tiana and others have mentioned. And it was a three-part workshop on strategic litigation. Uh, that is how the SANA uses the law to bolster resistance and advance their emancipatory goals. The specific uh, legal principle that was under discussion was the right of free and form prior consent or FPIC, which is crucial uh, in, many, in many territories throughout the Americas um, for for defending the territories against extractivism. And Carlos Rosero, who Tiana also mentioned, was providing an explanation of how they, PCN has been using uh, FPIC to create um, these strategies of strategic litigation. And he stopped kind of abruptly to vent his anger that uh, the Colombian state has, as, as, as most states in the, in the region, has signed Convention 169 that gives Afro-Colombians rights to FPIC, and then proceeded through one maneuver after another uh, to deploy strategies to limit and suppress the efficacy of, these, of, this, of this free and uh, form prior consent that was so crucial to the, to the strategic litigation. And Carlos's outburst catalyzed a break in our in our planned agenda, and 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 and, and examples from each of the participants from the seven countries of, of their own experiences of this of this breaking of the of the uh, of the potential of the rights gained, and it wasn't it wasn't that the states were actually canceling or withdrawing the rights. Although subsequently that's been increasingly the case. But the, what the break brought forth is this image of the rights being hollowed out from within. That was 2014. 
and it produced a, a framing a hypothesis, really, that, that the three-decade expansion of rights that indigenous and Afro-descended peoples had achieved, both to equal citizenship and rights grounded in cultural difference, that the expansion was coming to an end. We affirmed, of course, that the rights had serious limits from the start by design and through their entanglement with, with neoliberal economic policies, policies that deepened uh, conditions of inequality uh, much more effectively than whatever counterbilling benefits would come from the rights themselves. But still, we affirmed, I think, and Tiana, um, I think, made this point very forcefully, that the rights had been instruments of struggle. Um, and then the project then became an effort to figure out what, um, what the, the effects of this hollowing out of the rights would be and how the movements had begun to forge distinctive strategies of resistance, which it then would help us uh, create a diagnosis of the emergent forms of racism that they were confronting. That was 2014. And as I reread the chapter that Leith and I wrote last, last uh, weekend, uh, what was most, one of the passages that was most resonant was uh, precisely that reflection that this is so much has happened since we began this project, which, which deepens, uh, we wrote, we observed all the telltale signs when we formulated our central research hypothesis in 2014, but we, we did not imagine the ugly, violent, and all-encompassing deaths of the rupture. So to understand the America's wide wave of racial retrenchment, uh, we argue in this chapter, we can't think of Trumpism or its eerily parallel counterparts in most, if not all, of the other six countries as, manifest as manifestation only, but also as symptom as outgrowth of fundamental processes at play in the previous moment that culminated around the time that our research began. Rights had already begun to recede and ring hollow. Extractivism had already accelerated as a dominant expression of racial capitalism. Prominent outbursts of anti-Black and anti-Indigenous racial violence, uh, which had, which are our continuity throughout the last 500 years, had, had intensified and sparked resistance movement that looked beyond state granted rights as remedies. So the fundamental contradiction that, that we, were, we were focusing on, this hollowing out effect, was embedded in what uh, Nancy Fraser called progressive neoliberalism, a deepening socioeconomic inequality disproportionately affecting black indigenous peoples, combined with declining efficacy of rights meant to address these people's marginalization. We soon abandoned the language of a shift because it didn't capture by any means the virulent America's wide lurch to the right that we were, that our teams were documenting. <clears throat> and we started thinking in terms of the emergence of a new project of racial retrenchment. Rights being hollowed out sounds relatively manageable, almost perhaps reversible. That by contrast, the key words in our process, in the process that our research chronicles are criminalization, mass incarceration, uh, deepening gendered violence, assassinations of right defenders, <clears throat> accumulation through dispossession. While these patterns are fairly well known on a descriptive level, they're poorly understood analytically as more than a convergence of frightening trends. Our, our contribution was, to, was this attempt to place them in America's wide explanatory framework that views it an emergent racial project as integral to, and in many ways, a direct outgrowth of the prior phase of racial capitalism. <clears throat> the term racial project has been long, around for a long time, famously de developed by Omi and Wynett, um, <clears throat> and their definition is fairly straightforward a specific institutionally backed distribution of societal resources along racial lines accompanied by an ideological justification that portrays this distribution as normal, proper, and just. <clears throat> we try to build on this concept, recognizing also the ways in which it needs to be further developed, uh, weaving four key features into our analysis. None of these features are completely new, 
but each is markedly ascendant and their convergence is potent and toxic. The first is a, deepening, a rapidly deepening racially structured economic inequality, inequality that batters societies across the board, yes, but that cannot be properly understood without highlighting its specific racial dimensions. Second, and this is a point that Tiana, I think, emphasized and we need to understand much better, uh, but we already were focused on it, that, that many working people of dominant cultures, whites in the US, mestizos in Latin America, who suffer from this deepening inequality, have two seemingly contradictory, come to two contradictory conclusions, that democracy is a sham, serving only the rich, corrupt, and powerful, and that and part of this important part of this sham is the expanding rights of racialized peoples in the past three decades. Those expanding rights are somehow to blame for their suffering. The third element is, is the way political and economic elites actively foster and reap advantage from those conclusions, portraying the suppression of Black Indigenous rights movements as a necessary response to the crisis. They've gone too far. Their, their identity politics have run amok. They pose a national security threat. And fourth and finally, uh, a, a topic that is important, it was addressed a bit in the first panel, the, the way in which black indigenous movements themselves had been weakened by these same forces of change. <clears throat> Especially the way in which multicultural, something that Emilicia spoke about in Guatemala, how multicultural rights uh, create a tendency for few, some to be distanced from the rest with excessive dependency on state recognized rights and, and philanthropic beneficence, which undermines the inclination or ability to wage struggle against systemic oppression. So this synthetic glimpse of the emergent project of racial retrenchment, dismal and grim as it may be, has a counterpart in the two paired observations. Their source, uh, uh, were sources of, of, of mild encouragement. We found novel strategies of resistance, which mark potentialities and at the same time are also diagnostic, fleshing out our understanding of the new racial project in the making. The resistance is grounded, this resistance is grounded in deepening skepticism of the assumption that victories in the struggle for state recognized rights are compatible with black indigenous freedom dreams. The apparent compatibility, which already became suspect in the previous era, started to appear simply preposterous. There was one very dramatic moment in, 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 in Luciani's presentation of her work where, where uh, it was, she framed it as a, a question after Brazilians were asking, how can we turn to the state for protection when the state is a massive perpetrator of anti-Black violence? One alternative is state-recognized rights to to state recognized rights as autonomy or self-determination, de facto seized and defended through political struggle, bolstered by building bases of political economic power that do not ask the state's permission and that assert what our Mapuche colleagues called epistemological sovereignty. But there's another element that, that became, was very pr prominent in these resistance movements. I think um, Tiana Bachel's comments focus us specifically on this duality, <clears throat> a complementary strategy of continuing to occupy the more conventional spaces of political assertion from elections to state endorsed rights to judicial maneuver. At first glance, these two strategies appear to be diametrically opposed, one committed to the politics of radical refusal and the other to counter hegemonic struggles from within. While internal debates in our research team, and, and, and uh, this is important to add, we, we had lots of debates, lots of disagreements, lots of, lots of uh, productive controversy. And this was, uh, uh, this was one topic of such debate. <clears throat> but the debates produced uh, a more nuanced conclusion emerged as the protagonists began by acknowledging the boundaries and the, between these two and then blurring them, which yields a kind of a, uh, Tiana called it a, a both and, uh, we, all, we refer to the chapter as a use and refuse sensibility with distinct strategic implications. That is, once an autonomous political horizon is firmly established as point of departure, 
It's easier to make tactical forays into the realm of state endorsed rights, legal claims, with less risk of being drawn in by their neutralizing allure. And conversely, a decision to use a system in this instrumental way can provide welcome cover in the faith of wrath and repression that radical refusal is apt to generate. We found instances of this use and refuse position throughout the seven sites of struggle, from the, from the Movement for Black Lives political program, to even uh, the Mapuche movements to recover ancestral territory, which draw amply on state resources while refusing state authority. And I think, uh, I, I would say Mariana Mora's uh, presentation in the morning talking about the teacher's pedagogic strategy might be another example. <clears throat> The second broad America's wide conclusion focuses on what Michael Dawson and many others call a legitimation crisis. In order to legitimate systemic inequality, the state has to perform a certain amount of functions perceived to serve the well being of the general population rather than solely the economic elite. All across the seven sites of struggle, this, this public thrust, trust, this public uh, legitimation is threadbare to the point that liberal democracy itself and certainly its associated regime of multicultural rights has been widely called into question. While the Trump Bolsonaro regimes are symptoms of this le legitimation crisis in the sense that they assign virtually no discursive importance to the principles of liberal democracy, but so is the wave of resistance epitomized by black indigenous mobilizations that comprise the sites of struggle in our study. Although the research was completed long before the global wave of protests against anti-black racism last summer, our analysis certainly anticipated these movements in pointing to the deep and growing refusal to trust the promises of liberal democracy, beginning with rights secured in the two or th previous two or three decades. <clears throat> so a final point here and I'm concluding. Uh, it has to do with uh, white supremacy, which I think Tiana uh, quoted as a, a central, central axis in, our, in the comparative, in the relational uh, analysis. Unfiltered affirmations of white supremacy in the US and parallel expressions of racial ideology throughout the Americas form a central part of the current panorama, uh, even more central than we observed in 2014 when the research began. <clears throat> Although clearly as Pamela mentioned, the, the intense anti-Indian racism at the beginning of the Morales, of, uh, the Morales regime was actually a uh, spark of origins of this whole process. In the chapter, we argued that the primary legitimating discourse of this new racial project was some kind of combination between the, this emergent uh, or the, 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 the white supremacist uh, premises and a radically anti-humanist post-racialism, a cynical stance that denies the existence of racism argues that people who raise the problem of racial inequality are themselves racist, the, uh, uh, the discourse of reverse racism, and, are <clears throat> and sets out to punish anti-racist movements as political enemies. It's anti-humanist in the sense that the very term racism itself gets emptied out of meaning and then weaponized to be deployed against anti-racist speech and action. This analysis of what of the legitimating uh, discourse of, of this new, uh, these new racial projects needs much further work, especially in, in light of the deepening crisis of the present. Will white supremacy displace nihilist post-racialism as a more central element in how the new racial project is explicitly legitimized? And I think this idea of reloaded mestizaje comes in uh, to play nicely in this question. And if so, can anti-humanist politics be countered by a reassertion of rights and other principles of liberal democracy? So to conclude a, a question about this, this use and refuse position, uh, which became central to our analysis. And, uh, uh, I'm interested in discussing whether the both and and the use and refuse are actually the same, same positions or, or something different. It's fairly straightforward to describe, but it's very difficult to express and sustain as a collective political sensibility. Refusal breeds disdain for dominant institutions, which makes strategies for use hard to justify. <clears throat> 
use conveys compliance that makes those committed to refusal bristle. How can this use and refuse collective political strategy be most effectively expressed and sustained? Finally, we could also, we could focus this very question back on our own institutions of higher education. How to use university resources to nurture these vibrantly anti-racist spaces while also supporting struggles for autonomous political economic power, which do not necessarily prioritize institutional change in the university. For all of us who work in universities, and especially those like myself that occupy administrative positions, this question and its corollary should continue to haunt us and should make future efforts of activist research like those that we tried to carry out with RIAR over the last 10 years all the more important to pursue. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, well, first, uh, thanks to Juliet Hooker and the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in the Americas, in America, <laughs> for the invitation to participate in, in this book launch that I consider a, a virtual feast. I'm gonna read also to, to stick to my time. It is a pleasure to comment on this book and the presentations today. As explained by many others, this volume is a re the result of several years of a collaborative process between social movement webs and intellectual activists reunited in the Anti-Racist Research and Action Net Network of the Americas. It is not possible to assess the rich contributions of this collection in a short comment, but the call to be a discussion in this book long inspired me to write a larger review essay that I will deliver soon. Here I will first highlight what I see as one of its principal contributions to then propose a critical dialogue with some of its arguments. One of its key contributions is providing a quote roadmap to understanding contemporary racial politics across the Americas, framing a global analysis of racial capitalism, the historic structural racism, which has dispossessed communities, destroyed life ways, exploited labor, and confronted social death in, hemis in hemispheric perspective, as argued by Juliet Hooker in the introduction. This constitutes a rigorous critique of methodological nationalism that allows an analytics in which systemic racism and anti-racist struggles of Black and Indigenous peoples are studied together in terms of common grounds, as well as differences in time and place. The long durée of the matrix that articulates capitalism, colonialism, racism, patriarchy, and empire is focused in a contemporary temporality that roughly runs from the last two decades of the past century to the first two of the current one. This account for no less than a racial reading of the global and regional historical juncture through the conceptual lens of two racial projects, multicultural liberalism and racial disrangement. <coughs> The category of racial project is elaborated beyond Omi and Winan, as, as Charlie Hale just said, as distribution of societal resources through racial lines, racial ideologies, and the struggles that inform both. The limits and contradictions of neoliberal multiculturalism are explored in the joint action research of the seven countries with theoretical and political insights from both movements and academic intellectuals, demonstrating different paths of its hollowing out as a racial project and how it's prepared the ground for racial retrenchment. This is done with nuanced analysis of continuities between the two racial projects that are seen as hybrid and contested through careful investigation of tensions, contradictions, and local variations. Paradoxically, the inability of neoliberal multiculturalism in its versions of cultural difference and equal citizenship of delivering social and racial equality, along with the double deception of alleged post-raciality and the specter of Black and Indigenous appropriation of national resources and representation, <clears throat> facilitated the rise of racial retrenchment as a pillar of the white supremacist patriarchal projects of the Trumps and Bolsonaro's of this world. The detailed dis dissection of the limits and contradictions of the two racial projects flesh out a critique of racial capitalism to make a compelling argument that nothing 
falling short of addressing the structural character of racism can be an effective premise for the a transformative racial politics. There are four arguments I will like to highlight here. The first is the positing of three dimensions of racial capitalism, especially prominent in the emerging era, which together comprise its recalcitrance, securitization, financialization, and accumulation by dispossession. The, this analytical trio serve as theoretical foundation to investigate contemporary reconfigurations of systemic racism in its diverse manifestation from extractivism and gentrification to new forms of debt peonage, criminalization of social movements, mass incarceration, militarization of black and indigenous territories to their systemic murder by police and paramilitaries and genocide. The second argument is that both racial projects demonstrate the inadequacy of state-centered right-seeking politics as a framework for black and indigenous politics seeking entangled forms of justice, namely social, racial, sexual, epistemic, and ecological justice, with the contradictions of the use and refuse that both Tiana and, and Charles Hale point toward. A third argument from this fundamental critique of neoliberal and neoconservative political rationalities, as it pertains to black and indigenous politics, is that the main source of a post-liberal radical racial politics are the anti-racist theories and practices of black and indigenous movement exemplified in Mapuche and movements uh, for Black Lives, politics of radi radical refusal. The fourth argument related to the critique of racial capitalism and the collaborative agenda that guides the book is that the leading agency of Black and Indigenous movements in combating, in com combating the very core of global racial and, uh, and patriarchal capitalism constitute beacons of hope and heralds of liberation for the whole planet. This leads to the chapters and presentation on Bolivia and the movement for uh, black lives. In her chapter, the difficulties of connecting anti-extractivism and anti-racist struggles in contemporary Bolivia, the weight of patriarchy, Pamela Kaya tells the story of the Observatory of Racism of Bolivia and, and allied social movements of which she was a leading member and their relations and tensions with the so-called indigenous state led by President Evo Morales from 2007 to 2018. She contends that efforts to build and expand a hegemonic project from Morales administration gave rise to multiple arenas of engagement and resistance, engendering a process where systemic relations of coloniality and racism paradoxically got reinscribed. The analysis focuses on two key arenas of activism and state policy, racism and extractivism. It shows how state policies derail from plurinational imperative of indigenous autonomy through previous consultation and the rise of Mother Earth in favor of a developmentalist project based on extractivist economies wanting to make Bolivia a regional supplier of energy under the empire of global capital in spite of its self-definition as a socialist communitarian state. This entails subordination of anti-extractivist and anti-racist claim to reasons of state, which ended in a fragmentation of activism. Integration of anti-racist activism to the vice ministry of decolonization promote paralysis, paralysis and what began as a vibrant movement in light of fierce anti-indigenous indigenous racism during the Constituent Assembly, while anti-extractivist movement was largely criminalized in the context of protests against building a highway in the indigenous territory of the Tiffness. In Kaja's words, quote, this process left social movements and civil society group pursuing a fragmented series of struggles, unable to connect anti-racist and anti-extractivist uh, principles. Furthermore, she argues that the politics prioritized a macho populism that restricted decolonization and anti-racism and all forms of discrimination to a legislative process monitored from above and centered on an essentialized notion of masculine indigenous identity associated with highland and Indian communities loyal to the president, thus marginalizing the plurinational principle upheld in the constitution and the anti-discrimination of plurisexuality. 
This leads calls to highlight emerging movement of indigenous women pulling together a renewed a radial, a resurg radical resurging indigenous policies of recognition, redistribution and representation of all out of what they had helped construct, a radical resurgent indigenous politics. In turn, the neoliberal racism at the movement for black lives in the US, in, in, in neoliberal racism and the movement of black lives in the US, Liz Mullings presents a carefully crafted participatory action research of the birth, growth, dissemination, facets, tensions, discourses, repertoires of action, projects, and horizon of the movement for black lives in the United States, which actually represent that combination of use and refuse that we were talking about. Analyzing hemispheric and world historical perspective. I, I will actually argue that even though it's not explicitly framed in that way, it is done from a world historical perspective. Mullins locate the temporality of US-centered racial project in the post-civil rights era, trying to hide neocolonial racism through corporate rhetoric of diversity and post-racialism, the later kicking in the age of Obama. The movement for Black Lives emerges in a moment of erosion of multicultural projects in the Americas, signaled by deepening inequalities, accumulation by dispossession as a defining feature of systemic racism, which is one of her contribution or to the concept. Mass incarceration and police racist violence as expressions of state terror that are symptomatic of the divorce between liberal democracy and the capitalist form of rule, which again is one of the main uh, arguments of the book that has been mentioned. Mullins argues that, quote, social movements for racial justice have not only generated some of the most significant social transformation of this epoch, but also stimulated and inspired other protests against injustice, providing to expand democracy for all. Against claims of several leftist intellectuals that, that, that they are mere identity politics, she contends that the production of inequality to, through racialized dispossession is a fundamental feature of capitalism, and dismantling it should be central to any political of liberation. Playing this drum, Mullins locate the movement for black lives within the long durée of the black, black radical tradition from Pan-Africanism and black Marxism to the black liberation movements of the 1960s. On this bit, the movement for black uh, lives had a hemispheric and global vocation since its inception. The movement for black lives in the US is now a national network with hundreds of local groupings organizing several community committees articulated around six goals and to the world on black people, reparations of past and continuing harms, redirecting resources from exploitative forces such as prisons and police to health, education and safety, economic justice, democratic community control and political power. The organizational web that that uh, were built by this movement and the transformation in common sense uh, and in the cultures of activism that it forged were the foundation for the George Floyd effect that inspired the largest anti-wave, uh, anti wave, anti racist wave of protest in, in history. It's self indicative of the unstable character of the current racial project, which is one of the main arguments of her article. Mullins concluded that the movement for Black Lives is an important part of the planet, planetary struggle for social justice, conceived broadly to include the intertwined access of race, gender and sexuality, nationality and class, and that the influence of feminist and queer politics is what we can see more of a rupture with prior ways of black social movements in, in, in the movement for, for black life. To end this brief comment, I want to raise three set of issues for critical dialogue. The first pertains to the uses of the notion of the decolonial in the book. Setting the terms and somehow uh, bringing my own perspective. Setting the terms for theorizing the relationship between historical colonialism and racial formation, it is argued in the first chapter that, quote, 
one approach in making this case is to lump all racialized people together over space and time, which results in broad affirmations that are generally valid, but more anodyne than analytically discerning, referring to the decolonial perspective. Likewise, later on it, on it is affirmed that, quote, from a decolonial perspective, the racialized terms of redistribution set in place through colonial conquest and dispossession have remained substantively unchanged. And by extension, this ostensible chief in justifying ideologies became relatively unimportant. Without disputing the validity of these critiques to some holistic version of coloniality, which tend to construct transhistorical analysis of the modern colonial metrics of power, I call to attention the need for recognizing difference and debate within, uh, within the decolonial perspectives where there are historicized analysis of racial patriarchal capitalism that for instance, transcend the divide between settler colonialism and Afro-pessimism, which is also discussed in, in the chapters, such as the strands of Caribbean critique of Neil Roberts and Louis Gordon and the decolonial Black feminism of Ochi Curiel and Juderkis Espinosa. Perhaps more important is that the language of decoloniality is now part of the lexicon, lexicon and imaginary of Black and Indigenous social movements of the region, including the PSN, as well as in the new global cultures of activism. The second set of issues relate to the relative absence of an analytics of crisis in the theoretical framework even though there are meaningful mentions of the conditions of crisis. For instance, when it's argued that, quote, while we agree with Dawson's observation of the legitimation crisis of racial capitalism, we posit that this crisis has already produced dialectically a successor ideology, well positioned to emerge as a powerful legitimizing force of the new era. Likewise, when Mullins contends that the rise of quote, the rise of extractivism following the global economic recovery of 2008 acutely accelerated, accelerated the redistribution of resources along racial lines. None, uh, nonetheless, end quote, nonetheless, the important arguments about the accumulation by dispossession as a foundation of racism, securitization as a pillar of neoliberal and neo-fascist modes of, of governmentality, and financialization as a secular tendency in millennial capitalism could have been founded more centrally in an, an analysis of the current multifaceted crisis of Western capitalist civilization. The third set of questions had to do with the use of the concept of populism. In framing the overall perspective is affirmed that, quote, political coalition propelled Trump and Bolsonaro unleashed populist sentiments and policy initiative diametrically opposed to the ethics and politics of multiculturalism, end quote. As mentioned before, Calle characterized the Morales regime as a much, uh, and as she mentioned in, in her presentation today, uh, characterized the Morales regime as a match of populism that restricted decolonization and anti-racism and all forms of discrimination to a legislative process monitored from above, end quote. I will I argue that this unexplored contrast between right-wing and progressive populism reveals the need to engage more directly debates on the very category of populism, which represents one of the main contentions in political theory and political practice in Latin America today, especially after the theoretical interventions of Ernesto Laclo and of the discussion about how to characterize the so-called pink type. Arguably, this will strengthen Kaji's important insight about the new seniorial racial patriarchal state in Bolivia. To close, I want to reaffirm that this volume constitutes a remarkable achievement for several reasons. It's hemispheric lens based on a world historical perspective. The framing of black and indigenous activism in terms of the structural underpinnings in racial patriarchal capitalism. The thoroughly historically comparative analysis the deeply collaborative methodology guided by transformative political objectives, the nuanced and creative theoretical perspective that together constitute a profound reading of the proximate past and present through the lens of the centrality of race.
it will surely become a necessary reference for theory research and politics. Thank you. Thank you, Agustin and Tiana, for your uh, excellent comments. And thank you to the panelists. We seem to be already at 3.30, which was actually our, the time we were supposed to conclude. So unfortunately, I don't think we're going to have time to actually um, answer the questions. I just want to thank those who um, shared their questions. Uh, Pablo Lopez Oro affirmed the importance of Tiana's point about the transnational. Vivienne Weitzner asked whether Black and Indigenous movements are working together um, increasingly across the region, and are we going to see that more in the future? Anthony Dest asked if we could say more about autonomia sin permiso and the ability of people dealing with repression and racist backlash to transcend the state, and Dolores Figueroa um, asked if, to what extent there might be an intergenerational difference between young and older um, uh, Black and Indigenous activists um, in terms of, of strategy. So maybe if um, a couple people could speak really quickly to that, we can uh, um, have a few minutes extra. If anybody has thoughts on those questions. Okay, I guess we will just, mm -hmm. okay. okay I, I mean. No, I, it, it's not specifically around the questions, but to close up um, and sort of connect with Agustin, um, I would like to uh, sort of uh, like pose a big question that I always ask in my classes around these issues, which are, you know, the intensification of extractivism, why does it always need some kind of, this kind of macho populism, right? What are the conditions in the formation of racial capitalism that that, that demands? So it's a question about the state, but it's a question also of, 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 of people organizing and relating to the state and uh, yeah. So I think that we are, um, out of time, so I, I just want to say, on, unless anybody else wants to jump in, I just want to thank Agustin and Tiana again. I want to um, say on behalf of all the contributors that this um, this volume was really the, you know, meant to help Black and Indigenous um, struggles in, in 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 whatever way we could, and that to the extent that the analysis is useful, we hope we know this is an ongoing dialogue, and we hope that um, to continue. Um, trying to think through these important questions about contemporary racial politics um, with uh, movements and uh, scholars. So thank you very much for being here and engaging with the book. Thank you so much for the volume.